Thank you. And it's nothing probably worse than adding to your own resume, but it, a very important addition to what was said was that most of the, the most passionate, most interesting learning times I had were the 1976 and 1980 Carter campaigns, where <laughs> I was in the, the, the pit at Cambridge Survey Research running all the analysis with John Gorman while the partner Pat Cadell was on the plane and, and, and working with the speechwriters. And a lot of my job was to coordinate between um, Stu Eisenstadt and the policy people or the speech writers <laughs> while everybody else was running around. And I also in 1980 had a rather surreal experience, which was I played Ronald Reagan in the practice debates for President Carter before the debate. And when I, I'll explain later why this was a uncomfortable experience. It's to, not because who am I to play Reagan, but because you might think it's a professor's dream to grade the president and say, you haven't done well here, or you only get a B plus there, or why is the economy in the tank? It's in fact very disconcerting to fluster the president. <laughs> and I, everything I saw at the time I thought was idiosyncratic to Hamilton Jordan, or the Carter team, or Miss Roslyn, or the president. And over the years, I realized the strange discomfort of the president and the debate practice was repeated with every president. And finally understanding that, understanding what it's, what's different about being a president was part of finally being able to put the pieces together and write a book about campaigns and candidates. Not about how did this one win or lose, but what is it that happens over and over in campaigns that can help us to understand future campaigns. And every time I'd been in a campaign, I had the luxury, in it, really, of going back to the university so that you weren't in perpetual motion with no time to digest what you had done. I would work the summer and the fall, and then I'd go back to being a real person out of the, 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 the pressure cooker. of the. It's like being in the uh, emergency room at the hospital. It's, it's all adrenaline and action. And when I would, would get back home, I'd say, what did I think was going to happen that never happened? And what mattered that nobody expected to matter? So you could start rethinking uh, how, what matters in campaigns. And then I had a very discombobulated experience, which was the Gore campaign of 2000. And to do that campaign after the fun energy and a lot of camaraderie of the Clinton campaign of 1992 was, <laughs> which planet am I on? Why is this so different? You know, what, what, what could explain why one campaign, the pieces kept getting back together, and in the other campaign, it was like a little league game when none of the kids could catch or something, and <laughs> everything went wrong. And from day one, something seemed wrong. I thought I wasn't going to be doing any more campaigns, but I was in Washington because my wife was in the State Department in charge of China, and Bob Squire, who later died of cancer, <coughs> during the campaign said he wanted me to be a fly on the wall with him and write the kind of great short memos I wrote in the Carter campaigns. And Squire's a person that's so much fun to be around. I said, well, this is a chance to learn because in Washington you see more of the power struggles and the interactions than you might see on the telephone when you're just doing the polling, even if you're just as important. And the first thing he said to me was, yeah, he says, we have a little meeting every week to make the decisions, just 17 of us. 
And I immediately knew something was wrong because anybody who's ever made decisions, I mean, there's a reason no jury in the world is bigger than 12 if you want to get a decision. <laughs> and that's already hard enough. And you really want decisions, you need a small group. And the idea that there were 17 seemed wrong. And then from day one, there was disarray. You, it, I write about it in the book. You have to decide why are you in the situation you're in and what's the cure. And at the time, in 1999, Al Gore had low polling numbers. Now, there's two ways to describe that. One is what well, your vice president and all vice presidents have bad numbers until they get the nomination. Mm -hmm. The other way is you're a victim of Monica Lewinsky and it's the scandal that has tainted you. Now, every professional said, it takes time, don't worry. It's not Monica, it's, you're just the vice president. Nobody knows what you are. But Vice President Gore decided, no, I'm fine, it's him. So the day of his announcement in Carthage, he was later that day on the air his interview with Diane Sawyer, in which he said the word disappointed five or six times. And the whole story for the next week was Gore separates from Clinton. Nothing Gore said about issues, the presidency, or what he stood for made the news. And by making the statement then by this rush to judgment, he looked both disloyal and he created friction in the White House between his staff and the Clinton staff that got in the way the whole campaign. And my first reaction was, okay, I have to write about campaigns. I felt so, even before Florida, I felt this, this needs to be explained. How can so many stars be so crazy? There were a lot of brilliant people, but things were, something was wrong. And I decided, well, it's either the strategy, the strategist, or one of the six pollsters. Or maybe it was one of the four media people. And then I realized there's a, there's a book that I had on my shelf by a geographer. And the theme of the book, basically, was that all maps are misleading, and that's why they're useful. <laughs> you, you, you buy a map to emphasize the features that you need to know about. The gasoline stations, the monuments, the hamburgers if you've got kids, the camping spots, the places where the fish are running, you know, biting, uh, where the deer are, are there. Whatever it is you're looking for, you don't want all the details. You don't want to know where the clothing stores are when you're looking for fish. You may want to know where the bait stores are. So you need a map that's particular to what you're doing. But in a campaign, unlike with road maps or hunting maps or even a Michelin guide to monuments in any country, things change very quickly. And so you realize how fast things change. So you can't just talk about a good strategy that you start with. You couldn't possibly have a strategy that, was, that would cover everything that could happen in a campaign unless it was the size of an encyclopedia. You know, coaches have to decide a playbook for every game, and they may make mistakes, and it may snow, but then they change the playbook, or it may rain, but you can't prepare everything you could possibly do, or you'll be so shallow that you won't be good at anything. And Everything changes, and there's really three reasons in, in campaigns things keep changing. One is there's always new media with new information, both more vulgar and more sophisticated, that are coming around. It's not, and everybody's always talking about the media revolution, as if it was the newspaper, the telegraph, the radio, the television, cable, Twitter, the internet, Matt Drudge, Facebook. There's always something that changes the game. I mean, it's only 1992, 20 years ago now, that James Carville became famous, and one of his sayings that made him famous was, in a campaign, you haven't said anything until you've said it on TV. What's TV? Do you mean the internet? 
Do you mean Facebook? Do you mean YouTube? Half of the